Hi everyone, I'm glad you've joined us. Why we do what we do. In part one of this series on why we do what we do, I talked a bit about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, and then about why we are here and our purpose in life. I wonder if anyone remembers what we said our purpose in life was. It's summed up in the answer to the first question in the Presbyterian Shorter Catechism. What is man's chief end? Well, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. We then talked about God's glory and what that means. We said that glorifying God meant appreciating him for who he is, showing him adoration and affection, and finally being in subjection to him as Lord and Saviour. No longer looking to always have our own way, but following him in all that he asks us to do. So today I want to continue with part two of the series of why we do what we do by looking at why we should glorify God and also how we should glorify God. Why should we glorify God? Well, firstly, it's because it is based on what God's word tells us to do. There's a pattern about glorifying God in the Bible. Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were and are created. We see from this verse that all things were created for God's glory. Now let's look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. It says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations for an ever and ever. Amen. What is this passage telling us about God and the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, first of all, it's telling us that God is the one who can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Secondly, it's saying that all glory in the church should be unto God by Christ Jesus. And thirdly, it tells us that this glory that goes to God should not just be in past generations, but also in this generation and in all generations to come forever and ever. Let's move on to another example in the Bible that talks about why we should give glory to God. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 and chapter 10, verse 31. For we are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. In this passage, Paul talks about the fact that we have been bought with a price. God gave his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the price to be paid for our sins to be forgiven. We have been purchased by God for a huge price. The life of his one and only son. So we are no longer our own. We belong to God. And because of this, Paul tells us that we should glorify God. He also tells us how we should glorify God in what we eat, what we, what we drink, and in everything we do, do everything to the glory of God. Let's read Psalm 86 verse 5 and Psalm 8 verse 13. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Among the gods there is none like you, O Lord. Nor are there any works like your works. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. 
For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. And I will glorify your name forevermore. For great is your mercy toward me. And you have delivered my soul from the depths of shale. So getting back to answering the question, why must we glorify God? We've already said that it is because it is a pattern from God's word, as we've seen. God gives us clear instructions that we should glorify him. And secondly, we should glorify God because he is the one who made us. He is the one who made us. Psalm 100 verse 3 says, Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We read then in the, in the New Testament in Romans chapter 11 verse 36. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. Everything is of God. Through him all things were made. We were made through him. He made us all. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 4 says, The Lord has made all for himself. So we were made for God's glory. The Lord has made all things, man, all of creation, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, Everything was made for his glory. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 21 says, This people I have formed for myself. They shall declare my praise. We read then in Psalm 19 verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. You only have to look up at the skies on a clear night to realize what a glorious God we have. The very heavens declare his glory. So how should we glorify God? There's lots of things to consider when we talk about how we should glorify God. Firstly, in a way that brings glory purely to God and not to ourselves. Following Christ's example in John chapter 8, verse 50, Jesus says, And I do not seek my own glory. If even Jesus was saying that he didn't seek his own glory, we should follow his example and not seek for our own glory. A hypocrite looks more to his own glory than God's. Listen to the judgment on a hypocrite in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 2. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. They have their reward. Cyprian, who was the Bishop of Carthage and a very early Christian writer, says, whom Satan cannot prevail against by intemperance, those he prevails against by pride and vainglory. So let's be careful not to do things in a way which is promoting ourselves. Aim purely at God's glory. How do we know that we are aiming purely at God's glory? Well, number one, when we prefer God's glory above everything else, if there is something else coming in competition with God's glory we make the sometimes hard choice to do things which result in God's glory rather than our own glory or our own desires then number two when we are content that God's will 
should take place even if it crosses our will. Sometimes that might even mean us having to look like losers so that God gets the ultimate glory. It can be difficult to trust God in such circumstances because he, d he doesn't always let us know how he's ultimately going to get the glory. We just have to trust him. But he knows that what he is doing is for the best. And then number three, we aim at God's glory when we are content to be outshined by others in gifts and esteem so that God's glory may be increased. Let's read from Philippians chapter 1 verses 15 to 18. Paul says, Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife and some also from good will. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defence of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. We also glorify God by a frank confession of sin. The thief on the cross had dishonoured God in his life, but at his, at his death he brought glory to God by confession of sin. Luke chapter 23 verse 41 says, We indeed suffer justly. This was the thief on the cross speaking, talking about him and the other that was crucified with Christ. We indeed suffer justly. He acknowledged that he deserved not only crucifixion, but damnation. But as a result of his confession of sin and asking Jesus to remember him, what did Jesus say to him? Luke chapter 23, verse 43 says, And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. It was not something that the thief had to look forward to, despite a bad life. By a frank confession of sin, he was able to receive forgiveness and to look forward to a life of paradise with Christ. Then, when the children of Israel first went into the promised land, they had to fight a number of battles against their enemies and God was with them at first and he even gave them a tremendous victory at the battle of Jericho. But in the following chapter we read about how the children of Israel sinned against God and a result of their sin God allowed them to be defeated in battle against the people of Ai. Achan had taken some of the idols what God called the accursed things and hidden them. This was something that God had specifically warned them not to do in Joshua 6 verse 18. We're going to read that briefly. Joshua 6 verse 18 says, And you by all means abstain from the accursed thing, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. So one man by the name of Achan disobeyed and as a result of this disobedience, let's hear what happened. We read in Joshua 7 verses 12 to 13. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you any more unless you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. There's a couple of things we can learn from this passage. First of all, 
God is a jealous God. He didn't want his people taking things that represented idols. Nothing was to come in the place of God. The people of Israel should already have known that from the Ten Commandments. We know from Exodus chapter 20 verses 4 to 6. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. And then the second thing we learn is that if we do wrong by taking idols to ourselves, God withdraws his favour toward us. And the only way we can put things right is by confessing our sins and separating ourselves from idolatry. God called the Israelites to sanctify themselves, to separate themselves from all that was unholy. He told them that they would never be able to defeat their enemies until they took away the accursed thing from among them. What idols are we holding on to? What things do we need to get rid of in our lives so that we can know victory over the enemy and know God's favour on our lives once again? Let's read briefly Joshua chapter 7 verses 19 to 20. Now Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I have done. So a humble confession exalts God. When we try to make excuses for our sin, this is dishonouring to God. We know that right from the beginning of God's word. When Adam acknowledged that he tasted the forbidden fruit but instead of a full confession he made excuses to God Genesis chapter 3 verse 12 says then the man said the woman who you gave to be with me she gave me of the tree and I ate if you had not given me the woman to be a tempter I wouldn't have sinned some excuse that eh God wants a confession that is freely offered and not forced. We find that from the story of the prodigal son. In Luke chapter 15 verse 18 it says, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. The prodigal son charged himself with sin before his father charged him with it. And then we glorify God by believing. Romans chapter 4 verse 20 says, He, and this was referring to Abram, did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. So by believing, Abraham was giving glory to God. You know, unbelief, is really an affront to God. He that believeth not makes God a liar. Let's read 1 John chapter 5, verses 10 to 13. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself, and he who do, does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son he who has the son has life he who does not have the son of God does not have life these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God that you may know 
that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Faith brings glory to God. It declares that God is true. John chapter 3 verse 33 says, He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. So by believing the testimony of Jesus Christ, we are certifying that God is true. And we're bringing glory to him as a result. God honours faith because faith honours God. We read in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 17, The God whom we serve, this is a testimony from Daniel, The God whom we serve is able to deliver us and will deliver us. This was said by Daniel long before he was delivered. But he testified to the fact that the God whom he served is able and would deliver him. Faith knows that there are no impossibilities with God. We should trust him even when we cannot see him. We also glorify God by fruitfulness. Let's read John chapter 15 verse 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. How is the Father glorified? By us bearing fruit and being his disciple, disciples. Paul explains the link between fruitfulness and glory in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 11 when he says, Being filled with the, the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. We must not be like the fig tree in the gospel, which had nothing but leaves, no fruit. It's not a profession, but fruit that glorifies God. And we must bring forth the fruits of love and of good works. We're told in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is, which is in heaven. So by us shining our light before men, others will be able to see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And then we glorify God by being contented in whatever state God has placed us in. And that can be difficult at times, especially in these times when we're kept locked up in our own homes and so on, in isolation. But whatever state God has put us in, we need to learn to be contented with. Paul glorified God despite the circumstances he found himself in. And in many respects, those circumstances were much worse than the circumstances we currently find ourselves in. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11 and 23 that he was in prisons more frequently, in deaths often, yet he learned to be content. Paul could sail either in a storm or in a calm. He could be anything that God would have him to be. He could either be in want or abound. It tells us in Philippians 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So what are some other things in which we glorify God? Well, we can glorify him in our praises, by working to draw others to God, when we suffer for God, and when we give God the glory in all that we do. And finally, by living a holy life. <coughs> I want to leave you with one final thought before finishing. Coming back to why it is so important to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. I want to read 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18. But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory 
just as by the Spirit of the Lord. By glorifying God and looking on his glory, this passage tells us that we will be transformed into his glory from glory to glory. And it all happens by the power of the Holy Spirit as we allow him to work in our lives. Next time we're going to look at the whole area of enjoying God forever. The Bible has so much to say about how we can enjoy God and I look forward to sharing some of that with you. In the meantime, let's reflect on how we should be glorifying God and why we should be glorifying God day by day. Let's remember that God made us and all things for his glory. And let's be careful to follow Christ's example and seek to bring glory to God and not to ourselves. Let's glorify him by being honest about who we are and what we've done and confessing our sins before a righteous God. And let's believe God in his word. Let's seek to be fruitful. And finally, let's be content with whatever circumstances God has placed us in. And believe that he is working all things together for good for those who believe, for those who are called by his name, and that he is changing us into his likeness as we glorify him and behold his glory. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to sharing with you again next time. God bless.